Hello, everyone. We'll give folks a moment to finish signing in, get all our attendees in here, and then we'll begin the webinar. All right, so <clears throat> welcome everyone. This is Erin Donovan, Interim Director for the AI New Orleans. Thank you for joining us for the CEU webinar from Lighting and Electrical Associates, or LEA, one of our professional affiliate members. This presentation today is called Treat Your Building as a Patient, the Use of Visible Light Disinfection to Reduce Surgical Site Infection. And this is presented in conjunction with Kenall Lighting. Just a note up top about the format. So all participants will be muted, but you can submit questions in the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. And we will have a Q&A session towards the end of the presentation, just to go over any questions that y'all have had. We'll be making a recording of this webinar available, hopefully uh, later on today or shortly thereafter. And um, just because we're a small team, if you do run into any IT issues, um, just please be sure to call in to the Zoom conference number um, that you received in an email. We're a small team, so we can't really troubleshoot um, any connectivity issues. If you are calling in, make sure that you send your full name and AIA number to lauren at aieneworleans.org, and she'll make sure that you get credit for the session. On the agenda today, we'll hear from Dr. Cliff Yonke on treating your building as a patient. We'll have a brief Q&A session and then we will close out with some of the upcoming events um, that we have here at the AI New Orleans. Dr. Cliff Yonke received his BS in engineering physics from the Illinois Institute of Technology and his PhD in physics from Northwestern University. He joined Kennell in 2013 bringing over 25 years of photonics and healthcare experience in a range of fields related to defense, telecommunications, radiation oncology, medical imaging, analytical instruments, and surgical lighting to Kennel. As one of the inventors of Indigo Clean, Dr. Yonke has led its development and introduction into healthcare facilities across the US. Widely regarded as the industry expert on visible light disinfection, he has authored numerous articles on it and led numerous studies, including Indigo Clean, demonstrating its performance in reducing bacteria and infections in clinical settings. Um, so now we will hand it over to Dr. Cliff Yonke. Very good. Let me go ahead and get my screen set up here. Uh, okay, yeah, there we go. Oops. All right. So, Lauren, can you see my screen? Yeah. Very good. Okay. So I'll begin here. So thanks again to everyone for taking time out of your day. Uh, you know, this pandemic has us all off our A game, right? And, uh, you know, give us a chance to tell you a little bit more about how we can, um, you know, help improve you, the safety and health of your patients in hospital settings. I'll say a few words about this technology, uh, not only for operating rooms, but <clears throat> for uh, other applications um, in healthcare as well. And then of course, there's a lot of discussion about uh, ultraviolet light these days as well. I'll be available to maybe answer a couple of questions on that towards the end, so. Uh, this is the AIA disclaimer information here uh, that you can get course credit for it. I'll let the experts speak to that in more detail. And all the material here is copyrighted by uh, Kenall and Indigo Clean. So I think you saw the course description when you signed up. Uh, the idea here is to talk a little bit about HAIs, which of course are uh, very prevalent in our mind right now. Uh, and then we'll break, break this down and really focus on operating rooms and some of the concerns unique to that setting. And then we'll talk about uh, how you can improve environmental hygiene um, and specifically a whole new class of uh, 
solutions called a whole room disinfection. And then we'll try to apply that to operating rooms and uh, break down some of the relevant categories in that um, uh, discussion. So for the learning objectives, um, again, there's five of them. Uh, we wanna understand the different types of healthcare acquired infections and the economic burden that they create for our healthcare system and how visible light can improve environmental disinfection and its importance in preventing these HAIs. And then we'll also identify some of the benefits of LED technology and non-visual lighting applications and quantify the benefit of visible light disinfection using currently available evidence for HAI reduction. This is important because we know that there's lots of neat things you can do with lighting, but ultimately it has to make sense to the bottom line of whoever's putting it in. So we'll focus on that. And then ultimately, once you've kind of proven that, you need to be able to apply the technology in a variety of applications. And so to do that, we wanna, of course, uh, give you some, uh, some guidelines and framework to do that. So healthcare acquired infections and the role of the environment in their transmission. Well, again, um, you know, I try to do these things and find pictures that don't uh, uh, disturb everyone at lunch, right? But really healthcare acquired infections are broken down into four buckets and it's all related to the portal of entry. That is, how does the bacteria get into uh, someone's body? And of course with COVID, that's a virus. So of course that also applies here, but typically they're more focused on uh, bacterial infections. But as I said, uh, COVID has uh, certainly raised our awareness of how viruses are transmitted as well. So you can see the four different portals of entry there, uh, a surgical wound, a catheter, a central line, or a ventilator. Again, those are all the basic uh, categories that this is uh, scored against. And some of the statistics for this are, are quite alarming. Uh, COVID notwithstanding, uh, typically one in 20 patients acquires an infection while in a hospital which leads to about 1.7 million HAIs and about 100,000 deaths. So uh, certainly quite a bit going on there. And if you look at the average cost for an infection of about $23,000, um, you can see that number gets quite large quite quick. And when you go through to understand the total cost of healthcare acquired infections, uh, not just the direct hospital costs, but if you look at both indirect costs and I'm gonna say the non-medical social costs, uh, there's been some studies that have been done on this, and you can see the number gets quite large. Uh, so it's in the billions of dollars, and you know that's obviously a, a very important consideration at a time when we're looking to uh, you know optimize our healthcare system and squeeze every dollar out of it that we can. So if you ever wondered how diseases spread, this of course is from the CDC, and this is uh, particularly relevant to uh, uh, coronavirus right now and COVID. Uh, you can see here, obviously, someone sneezing and everything kind of just spraying out in droplets in the air. And just to maybe put a point on it, um, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, shared patient rooms with these curtains and how that uh, uh, can um, uh, prevent disease. Really, of course, it doesn't because uh, uh, there's, you know, bacteria and stuff transmitted in the air. I mean, the curtain is really more than a privacy curtain. And, you know, this, uh, this cartoon kind of illustrates that point. And so folks for many years uh, had some belief about the fact that the environment uh, could be a source of pathogens and that, that could cause infection and transmit uh, disease. But people have taken, um, in the past, I would say probably 10 years or so, a lot of effort in studies to show how the environment and the rooms specifically uh, can, can do this. And so this is one example of a study. Uh, they were looking at uh, the chance of you getting an infection based on the room you were checking into and the status of the prior room's occupant. So if the prior room occupant, and you can see here, had an, uh, an infection, um, you were uh, roughly about 11% of those patients acquired um, the infection when they got into that room. And uh, if uh, the previous room occupant did not have an infection, the people had a little over 4% chance of getting an infection. So you can see it's about a 265% difference uh, in getting an infection based on whether or not the previous room occupant had an infection. And that tells you that the previous room occupant is leaving something behind. And interestingly enough, in the US, um, air quality is very important to us, but there's no ISO standard for it. Um, you'd be amazed to realize that there's all sorts of standards for clean air, where we make cell phones, where we compound pharmaceuticals, uh, and perhaps other uh, you know, considerations. But in an operating room, there is no uh, standard for the quality of air. And this is particularly important because Staph aureus is a common pathogen um, for surgical site infections, and it's found on healthcare workers' hair and skin. And you know, the simple act of walking releases about a, a thousand skin particles per minute, 
and maybe about 10% of those uh, skin cells carry viable microorganisms that can cause an infection by getting into a wound. Then you can see over here on the right, of course, just some animations to um, you know, maybe put a point on it. You can see the, the one at the bottom is particularly interesting. And this is a study that's been done where people will come in and they'll prep the, uh, the room by laying out the surgical instruments. And of course, they come in in a sealed uh, uh, tray, uh, but then they pop the tray. From the moment they open the tray till the time they start the procedure, they found bacteria on these, um, these instruments. And you know, if you wind the clock back to 1861, uh, you can find Joseph Lister, who, you know, of course, the founder of you know, kind of Listerine, right, um, you know, had a very famous uh, uh, statement that said, it's not uh, the air, it's something in the air. And I think that's particularly relevant here. Uh, it just reminds you that, uh, that this is a, a consideration throughout the entire hospital. And if you look at some of the different types of organisms, again, this is probably, you know, uh, Greek to a lot of uh, folks on the call here, but you may have heard of some of these like uh, MRSA, and uh, you can see that they can live in the environment for weeks and months and years. Uh, viruses typically live less, um, you know, you can make another chart there for coronavirus, which we're still learning about, you know, hours to days, right? But uh, again, you know, you think of cruise ships and norovirus, this is how many people get infected on those, um, those uh, cruise ships. And historically, what we typically did was before someone went into a surgery, we would just uh, give them an antibiotic. We'd pump them full of antibiotics, and or if they got an infection, we'd pump them full of antibiotics. And the problem is that antibiotics are kind of coming to an end. Uh, it's the, the fact that bacteria can continually adapt and evade to these antibiotics, which are very different than uh, antivirals. Again, uh, you know, for COVID, we're looking for a vaccine, which is very different than an antibiotic. Kind of serves the same you know, purpose. It's something you inject to kill the organism, but uh, the way they work are quite different. And so, you know, bacteria can um, adapt to these antibiotics, which is why you get antibiotic-resistant superbugs. And here you can see on the left, the head of the CDC, uh, kind of putting a real exclamation point on all this, saying, you know, we've reached the end of antibiotics, period. And so what that really speaks to is the need to look at this in a different light. So just to give you a, a feel for some of the, um, the uses, I'm sorry, I hit a little too fast there, uh, for continuous environmental disinfection, uh, let me just give you a quick uh, historical review on the topic. Um, you could go back as far as 1863 to find that Florence Nightingale identified the fact that sunlight heals wounded soldiers. And in 1890, Robert Cook identified the fact that sunlight kills TB. And you know, not surprisingly, we use sunlight to disinfect water. I don't know if you all ever made uh, uh, tea out in the sun. My mom used to do that all the time. Uh, you know, there's clearly something going on uh, with sunlight. And again, another uh, example is um, hanging clothes on the you know, clothesline outside before, you know, we didn't have washing machines when we were kids. We weren't that luxury, I guess. Um, and so we'd hang the, the, the clothes on the, on the line and, uh, you know, the uh, clothes would come in smelling really good and fresh. And part of that was because you were killing the uh, mold and bacteria in the socks or whatever was hanging on the line with the UV light in the sun. And this is particularly relevant because right now uh, it's been in the news. There's lots of talks about using UV light. And this is something that I could, you know, have a separate hour long talk on. Uh, there's a talk coming up from the IES next week. You might want to sit through it's, it really, uh, UV light is not the panacea. I think some people think it may be. Um, there's different uh, sections of the spectrum and they have different effectivity against different organisms, and they have different safety implications, and they have different effects on materials in the environment. So it's, again, it's not something that uh, you can just point a UV light at something and, uh, you know, make everything better. And here's some examples of how it's used in hospitals. You can see there's some folks that have put UV lights up in the ceilings of operating rooms. There's these um, upper air germicidal lights. Uh, they've been around for years. Again, people use them for TB. Uh, purposes, but uh, uh, most hospitals have taken them out uh, just because of the safety hazard. Um, there's, uh, you know, portable uh, UV uh, device disinfection over in the little uh, lower left corner there. And on the right, there's these uh, portable devices that you wheel into rooms and they disinfect the room. And those are, you know, certainly very helpful products. I know they're using them for several ICU rooms in uh, COVID these days, but uh, as you would expect, people can't be in the room when they're on. And so, interestingly enough, there's, um, you know, all of this uh, pioneering work uh, kind of led, led to uh, uh, 
a, a group in Scotland uh, at the University of Strathclyde, uh, which is in Glasgow, to uh, look at and look for um, you know this uh, this type of uh, technology. But they discovered uh, something uh, called visible light disinfection, which was uh, a way to disinfect using a different portion of the spectrum that's strictly visible, uh, no ultraviolet. And here you can see um, you know, how it sits relative to some of the other um, uh, portions of the spectrum. The slide has gotten uh, crunched here. Uh, my apologies. The markers don't show uh, correctly where 254, which is the typical UV germicidal wavelength, and 405 sit at. Uh, I'm not sure how this happened. I, we'll, we'll get it fixed when we distribute the slides. Uh, but it should be around 405 nanometers. So that's the previous slide here you can see um, in the lower right corner of that graphic. And the university actually started working on this technology um, almost 20 years ago now, started as a young lady's PhD thesis, and they had been investing in it uh, over those years. They've done a lot of work on it, and uh, they filed their first patent in 2008, and they've done uh, numerous publications on the topic since then, uh, extending the effectiveness of the technology and, and basic research into the technology. And uh, it was first made commercially available in 2015 here in the U.S. And I want to emphasize um, you know, how this technology is possible, because certainly that portion of the spectrum has been available uh, for quite some time. But it's really about the fact that uh, LEDs are uh, the enabling technology. And just to highlight the fact, it's really LEDs in uh, are the leading the way for a, a range of new uh, non-visible applications. And the reason for that is that you can create these customizable spectra with much higher output power than conventional sources in a very small form factor. And you know, what you're ultimately doing um, is you're trying to shine light onto a biological organism, whether it's uh, tissue, an organism, plant, uh, you know, people use this in horticulture, right? Um, and what you're trying to do is get it to absorb the light and absorb enough of the light to create a response. This is the dose response curve in the lower left corner. And uh, you know, that's ultimately what you're seeing here. So on the right, you can see some of these different spectrums that are used for circadian lighting, um, for horticulture and, of course, for visible light disinfection. So how does visible light disinfection work? Well, so the simplest way to think of it is it's constantly on. You never want to turn the lights off. You always want to leave them on because you're always killing bacteria. And as long as you inject this antimicrobial blue light into the room, this is an operating room here on the left, it reflects around the room and it kills bacteria continuously. So on the right, you can see uh, really the way disinfection is broken down in these areas. It's uh, either continuous or episodic. Episodic is what we're used to. You come into a room, you spray uh, bleach on a surface, you use UV light, you kill a lot of bacteria, but in a short period of time. And then down there at the bottom, uh, you can see the uh, continuous disinfection. It has a lower level of germicidal activity, but it runs 24-7. So it fills in the gaps when you're not normally disinfecting. And of course, it does, it does improve whatever you're already doing. And without making this a class of microbiology, you can see that the bacteria has something within it called a porphyrin molecule that absorbs the blue light, and then it fragments into something called reactive oxygen. And that reactive oxygen, you're probably not familiar with it, but you're familiar with bleach, which is the same idea. So you're creating this bleaching agent within the organism that causes it to die. And by running this light continuously, as I just noted, you create this hostile environment where the organism can't survive. So eventually it dies. And now there's a ton of data out there. Uh, one manufacturer has data showing reduction on uh, bacteria in Petri dishes, um, reduction in occupied clinical settings, and then ultimately kind of the holy grail of showing reductions in surgical site infections, because that's ultimately what any hospital who would consider deploying the technology would want to understand. And you can, of course, extend this to other areas of the hospital, whether it's patient rooms or you know, whatever area you like, but the operating room is certainly very compelling. And so here's an example of how it could be used in an operating room. Um, and so the key, effort, the key point is that the visible light disinfection is a continuous environmental disinfection system. And you would normally just run it and it would be this kind of all blue mode shown on there at the right. But of course, that's not visually appealing for people. Uh, you would never want to try to perform a procedure in that. So instead, you mix that uh, antimicrobial uh, blue light with white light, and you put it right in the normal light fixtures, the ones that people typically don't pay attention to that are in the ceiling of the room there, the two by four, two by two, so on, uh, light fixtures. 
And again, this particular application shows how it can be used in a dual mode technology where you have the, the white plus blue uh, running in um, you know, kind of one mode when people are in the room doing procedures because they need to be able to see. But you're getting this real time benefit with the uh, lights on. And then when people leave the room for the day, again, typical to an operating room, it flips into an all blue mode. And that all blue mode is still safe for people. It's just not visually appealing. It looks more like a disco club. And again, you know, people are always concerned about the safety of this as they rightly should be. One of the unique things about this technology is that it can actually be considered um, exempt and because regular overhead lights are treated uh, or based on their, their output spectrum can be considered exempt. That means there's no safety risk. People don't have to be monitored and there's no um, occupational hazard. And so uh, the way this visible light is accessed is you uh, simply can kind of compare it to either uh, overhead sunlight, which is on the left there, or there's actual numerical standards which are used to assess the safety as well. And so, um, you know, on the left there is overhead sunlight. That's the thin blue line there. That's D6500 for those of you that uh, are familiar with it. And that's just a representation of irradiance or intensity, if you like, on the vertical axis and wavelength or color on the horizontal axis. And in that all blue mode I just showed you, it's still less than overhead sunlight. So, you know, that's why it's treated as exempt. That's uh, over on the right there, meaning that there's no safety considerations required, no timers required, no interlocks required, no nothing required. And that's even in the all blue mode. If you look at the, um, the white mode, as I showed you on the left there, um, it's about 20 times less. So that purple hump would be a factor of 20 smaller. And then there's some additional international standards that use the same uh, qualifying uh, mechanisms to determine that the, uh, the light is safe for people. For ultraviolet light, um, it's a very different uh, subject um, because uh, it is a known carcinogen. Um, ultraviolet light has to be controlled, which means you have to have interlocks. It means there's a dose threshold, which means that you know, if someone exceeds that threshold, uh, it's a liability question. So again, two very different uh, approaches to the, um, uh, the solution. And of course, you can put this in a variety of applications in a healthcare setting. Here's just a few. Uh, you can put it in a patient bathroom, a waiting area. Uh, SPD stands for sterile processing department. That's where they reprocess endoscopes. Um, you know, the pharmacy where they do compounding of chemicals, the emergency department or trauma triage areas, uh, procedure exam rooms, and of course, the operating room. And that's why we're focusing on the operating room today. The operating room is really interesting application because it describes, uh, or it, because of four reasons, excuse me. Um, it's uh, medically relevant, you know, as I think I mentioned, surgical site infections are a huge consideration for most hospitals. They actually represent the largest cost for all infections in a healthcare system. Uh, in the operating room, the technology can be very effective. Uh, you have large amounts of light in there, which means you can piggyback on large amounts of blue light while still uh, not making the room look funky. And then the room is used about 12 hours a day. So you can have this all blue mode running for about 12 hours a day as well. And these rooms are highly occupied as we're seeing right now with the COVID pandemic. Uh, when hospitals had to turn off their elective surgery uh, throughput, right? That just killed their, um, their financial situation. It's their entire business model. Uh, the the uh, cancer uh, treatment and the um, uh, elective surgeries. And, you know, those rooms are highly occupied. They're scheduled back to back just to maximize uh, the business model for the hospitals, which leads very limited to alternatives uh, for them to provide additional disinfection. So I think I may have mentioned earlier when you, you know, have this going on in an operating room, uh, the technology is killing bacteria in the air and on hard and soft surfaces. And that's important because, uh, you know, some things focus on the air, some things focus on surfaces. This addresses both. And because it's visible light, it can get to hard to reach places. Um, visible light scatters. But the other mechanism here is that bacteria that end up on surfaces uh, frequently do so because they precipitate out of the air. And if you kill the bacteria while they're in the air, they can't precipitate onto the surface. So uh, the line of sight considerations that are typical with UV light don't really apply here. And uh, again, just to kind of help you understand how you might lay this out, if you look at a typical operating room, uh, most operating rooms are laid out as we've shown here, uh, you know, there's different zones of illumination over the table. So that's in the center on the left there. You can see the table with the uh, different light fixtures, uh, putting light into the center. 
And then as you uh, kind of move further out, the fields don't overlap, so you get less light. And there's different uh, zones and different recommended foot candles for each of those zones of illumination. And on the right is this little eye chart, which shows um, you know, all the different numbers uh, representing foot candles. And the yellow uh, boxes there are the two by four light fixtures placed around the room. And then uh, just as you know, a kind of point of reference, you know, when you're lighting a room, you know, there's guidelines and you uh, put enough light fixtures in there to hit the recommended foot candle levels. But when you're trying to disinfect a room, that's a different story. So, you know, I'm gonna try to answer this here for you, but let me just ask it as a question. How many lights do you need to disinfect the room? Because that's not intuitive. That's the science that uh, has taken some time to, to come to work. And it's certainly a science that I've been personally involved in. So when you look at this, it's really three concepts. Uh, the first key concept is to get the right disinfecting wavelength. And that means you need the, the, that's that coupling between the light to that porphyrin molecule. Remember, we were talking a few slides back about how the bacteria absorbs the light. You need the right wavelength. And with UV light, this is true as well. Um, you know, they're finding that UV light, um, it needs to be around like 250 nanometers to kill viruses and about 260 nanometers to kill bacteria. It's very different. Um, and that's just the way that it couples to the organism. Uh, so for this, you know, you want to make sure that the manufacturer has the right disinfecting wavelength. 405 is a typical, um, you know, kind of number, just like 254 is a normal number for UV. But you, again, you want to make sure that your manufacturer has the right wavelength. Uh, and then there's the design of the luminaire itself. And this just is the intensity. It's can you put enough LEDs in the fixture and have the right lens design to create the right irradiance, um, which is the amount of disinfecting power per unit area below the light fixture. And so that's sort of just what one fixture would do. And then you need to have enough fixtures in the room to dose the room properly. And these are required to kill certain organisms and to make sure you disinfect the entire room. So how would you specify this? Well, again, I'll, I'll try to hit a few of the key points here, right? Uh, the thing is, is don't try to in, uh, engineer this yourself. You're a lighting professional. You're not going to dose the room. So that's where the, you really should light the room according to IES standards and then ask the manufacturer, if I light the room this way, what's your claim? Or do you recommend I do something different, right? And that claim should be expressed as something called bacterial reduction over time. Or if they can even uh, refer to reductions in infections, so much the better. And the claim should be something over a 24-hour period for continuous disinfection. And that's very different than visible or than um, episodic disinfection. If you go up and spray bleach on a surface and wait 10 minutes and wipe it down, then that's, you know, kind of one claim, right? It says it kills, you know, some amount of bacteria after 10 minutes. But this is running continuously. And while it's running continuously, people are coming into the room. That's adding bacteria to the room. So you're adding it to the room and you're taking it out. So you're, the manufacturer needs to have all that taken into account when they make a claim for how the technology performs in a room. And then make sure you ask them for clinical data. Uh, don't let people just uh, sell you snake oil here because right now that's what's happening. Uh, we see a lot of this, particularly with some of the ultraviolet light that's coming out there. A lot of people are uh, just making these egregious claims or they've done it in a, a, a petri dish setting where they shine the light on bacteria in a petri dish and say that, that it works. And then finally, that, that whatever claim they have, whatever data they have, should be something that's been reviewed by relevant medical professionals. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's not your job, you're a lighting professional. So it should be like published in a peer reviewed journal. And so again, just to be uh, kind of let you know, I would say be careful uh, in an emerging application people will try to get away with whatever they can claim, right? And you know, just like Ronald Reagan said uh, you know, 30 years ago, right? Trust but verify. Uh, don't trust your manufacturer, trust their data, right? And make sure it's data for their product, not someone else's. Make sure it's in the application for which they claim and that the data is based on the illuminance used. Um, what happens is in some cases, people will uh, uh, cheat. They will show you uh, uh, data from uh, taking the petri dish or whatever it is and moving it six inches from the light and of course that's not how it's going to function normally so you want to make sure that you get you know kind of actual room data uh, that shows how this is deployed and that's why i just want to emphasize again laboratory data can be manipulated and may not be applicable to your application and again ask for third-party references um, you know if somebody else is using it and uh, has a good experience with it then let them tell you about it. That will help, I think, overcome some of the uh, uh, concerns that many of your customers may have. 
And you know, in doubt, if you're in doubt, find someone in the hospital who's an infection preventionist and ask them about it. Um, you know, you may not see that side from where you're at. I know a lot of infection preventionists are being included in the design processes now. So again, uh, you know, don't feel, don't be afraid to ask for help. So let's go through some of the clinical data in the last uh, 10, 20 minutes here. So the, the first uh, clinical data was garnered by the university. This was an ICU room over at the um, uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And here you can see on the left, uh, a simple study they did where they have the lights on and lights off. So they start with the lights off. Uh, they measure a certain amount of bacteria in the room and the vertical axis is the amount of bacteria. And then after uh, they turn on the lights, they see this big dip, a 76% reduction in the amount of bacteria. And then they turn the lights off and they see the amount of bacteria rise. So that really clearly confirms that the lights were the determining element. And then when you look around the room at the different uh, um, surfaces in the room and the amount of bacteria on those surfaces, you can see that roughly the disinfection is spread out through the room evenly. And that's important because, you know, again, you could cheat and put the light directly above a surface, but then you're only disinfecting that surface, which is just not helpful. So in the U.S., some of the studies I was involved with, uh, first were in a, a waiting room. Uh, we actually started in a, a simple waiting room. Uh, of course, we knew that these rooms were probably filthy dirty. Uh, we put some lights in there. And, you know, this is important. It was about the size of a small OR. It's, you know, has some proximity to rooms where they're doing sterile procedures. So, um, you know, what we found was quite interesting. Um, where we didn't run the lights for a week and collected uh, bacterial uh, measurements and then ran the lights for a week, we saw about a 70% decrease in the amount of bacteria in the room. Pretty substantial stuff, right? And that's just from running the overhead lights. And so with that, we built some uh, uh, you know, models around how you could actually dose a room and started to find more compelling applications. So we went to uh, the Maury Regional Medical Center, which is just south of Nashville, and we looked at some of their orthopedic ORs there. And so we had two rooms. One is a control room. The other room was the room under test. And when you collect data for this stuff, it takes a while. It takes about a month. And you're collecting uh, Petri dish samples, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite a number of Petri dish samples throughout the day. Uh, you're getting them in the morning. You're collecting about 50 samples per room per day. And so here you can see uh, the kind of ba bacteria levels in the room over time. And uh, the red line is the room that uh, eventually gets the uh, disinfecting lights. The blue line is the room that never gets the lights. And you can see over on the left, they're about the same to start with. And then about halfway through, uh, you introduce the visible light disinfection and you see the uh, bacteria levels drop. And again, this is just the physical layout for you. You can see how the rooms were set up here directly adjacent to each other. Interestingly enough, they're connected by the same branch of the uh, HVAC system. And uh, you can see some of the sampling points in the room there. And what we found is that in the room with the lights, we saw an 88% reduction in bacteria in the room, pretty substantial. Um, and actually that was important because we actually saw less bacteria compared to the control room as well. So we, we had pretty good confidence that what we were seeing was a real effect. But what confused us was the fact that the room that never got the lights saw a reduction in bacteria in it. That didn't make sense. So we started to look at um, uh, the rooms and what we found was that the two rooms that we studied were on the same branch of the air handler. And that was really interesting because uh, that suggested that we were seeing some type of cross-contamination between the rooms. And there were certainly common procedures, equipment, and staff between those rooms. So again, very interesting. Um, but what we did was we went and took a third room down the hall. That was a, a room that we used as a distant control room, which was on a different branch of the air handler and didn't have the same types of uh, procedures, equipment, and staff being used. And so when we summarize all this, and this has been published in a peer-reviewed medical journal, um, the center line there is the room with the lights. That's operating room number two. And you can see that over a course of a year, their number of infections went down by 73%, pretty substantial. And in the room adjacent, that was the control room, it went down, which I think we believe we explained that due to uh, reduction in cross-contamination. Um, but the room uh, further away that was isolated showed no change in infections. And that really kind of crystallized our hypothesis and understanding of this. And I, I'll, I'll skip over this in the interest of time. This is about the uh, different types of organisms that we were seeing. This is a, uh, the publication uh, article. It's available online for folks who want to go get a copy of it. And it's just a summary of the entire experiment, again, showing uh, the different benefits between the control and test room and the distant control room. 
Now, how does this compare for uh, financial purposes? Well, quite interestingly, uh, you, when you go through and do the math on this, if you think of the average cost of a surgical site infection as about $23,000, I think, um, just putting the lights into one room based on kind of a not notional cost of the system and the cost of the lights gives you a two-month payback scheme, which is pretty impressive. You know, think about it, a two-month payback scheme is really um, uh, a pretty good capital investment that you can show, not to mention the cost in human lives. And these are some of the places where the technology has been studied. Again, uh, it's, it's not something that's new. There's no guinea pigs out there now. The, the, the technology works. And okay, so let me just kind of start to wrap up here. We'll talk about some of the other applications. Um, so outside of the operating room, other areas where you could put this, the patient bathroom is a great application. Uh, turns out a lot of the stuff that's in the patient rooms is gastrointestinal, uh, which of course highlights the need to disinfect the bathroom. Bathrooms are not that highly occupied, so you can have it in the blue mode for a good chunk of the day. And uh, it flips to white mode when somebody comes in with a simple occupancy sensor. And the emergency department, it's a wide range of applications here uh, because you just don't know how busy the ED is. Uh, obviously with COVID, some EDs are very busy, uh, others are not. And uh, when people come in off the street, who knows what they're bringing into the facility. And you just can't shut these areas down in general to use the really powerful technologies like hydrogen peroxide or UV light. And pharmacy and sterile processing is a real important application these days. There's new USP standards out for clean room standards, uh, particularly related to quality of, um, of cleanliness in the room. And this can help those people achieve those standards. Again, it's hard to shut the rooms down. Many of these pharmacies um, are running, and acute care places are running most of the day. Uh, for cancer centers, they may run a fraction of the day, but other areas do run uh, most of the day. And if you think of rehab and therapy, this is another great application. Uh, you know, people obviously can, um, uh, you know, transmit uh, bacteria just by being on the different exercise equipment together. Uh, you know, you sweat and you get stuff on. I know people try to wipe it off with a towel. That's, um, you know, minimally effective, right? And, you know, we're hearing from a lot of uh, health clubs now about how they're going to make their potential customers feel safe when they come back after this COVID stuff has wrapped up. And so again, if you think of any of the applications, you always just want to go back to those four key questions, right? Is it medically relevant? Uh, is the technology effective? Is the room occupied uh, quite a bit? And are there limited alternatives? Because if so, then it's a great application. And of course, we could keep going on with different applications here. And you know, when you talk about less critical applications, you can use it there, but cost is always a concern. Um, you know, hospitals know they have bacteria everywhere. Uh, and particularly if you get outside of healthcare, uh, you know, prior to COVID, no one would have ever thought of spending the money to put lights like this in their health club. They're just running on such a small margin, right? And you just really need to go back and understand what the value is um, for, for these applications. So there are potentially value-based products out there that don't have the full functionality of this dual mode technology. And you can see this as both dual mode and single mode, and we call it a technology extension. And essentially the single mode you would use anywhere except the operating room. Uh, the operating room, you want the really high quality uh, performance. So that's why you would want that. But outside of that, um, you could use it uh, in a variety of different ways. And if it's the price is the primary concern, you would go with the single mode technology. It does kill uh, bacteria, it kills staph, it doesn't uh, kill viruses, it doesn't kill some of the more hardy organisms like C. diff. So, uh, but again, those organisms don't generally appear in some of the less critical areas. And so when you're trying to specify these single mode areas, you know, how would you, how would you do that? Well, it's simple, you light the room as normal. And you just light the room as normal and you would put the single mode light in wherever you can. Um, kind of on a one-for-one -one replacement. And you want to do them all with this technology to make sure it gets color matched. Uh, the 405 nanometer uh, chip can pull things off of the uh, color point. So you want to make sure you get them all matched. And, you know, you kill bacteria. And some people will say, well, what does it kill? Well, you know, talk to your manufacturer, right? Ultimately, it's better than killing no bacteria. I mean, how much bacteria are light killing today? So let me just try to wrap up here and uh, we'll get ready to, time to take some questions. Um, you know, in summary, the LED technology has enabled this non-visual benefit for lighting. VLD is an example of this type of benefit. It's been shown to reduce surgical site infections. And again, we wanna emphasize the fact that uh, with non-visual lighting benefits, you really should be talking to 
uh, people who are experts in the field or follow some evidence-based guidance for its implementation. Don't try to do this on your own and, you know, don't trust but verify what the manufacturers are telling you. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here and we'll pass it back over for questions and answers. Yeah, so we'll give folks a moment to enter any questions into the Q&A function down at the bottom. And while they're doing that, I'll just talk a little bit about, um, you know, ultraviolet light. Um, you know, ultraviolet light is, uh, I have friends who work at a lot of these places. Um, they're, they're great products. They do a great thing, but you have to understand how they work. And you have to understand the difference between you know, what I'm going to call the method of scientific action and operationalizing it, right? There's, uh, does the UV light kill something? And the answer is yes. There's lots of science around there about how UV light can kill certain things. Um, when you think about how it works uh, in other things um, uh, and how it can kill uh, different organisms, you want to make sure you're getting the right wavelength of the right uh, uh, organism. But then also you want to make sure that you understand all the safety and operational impl implications of using that technology. So all right, we have a couple of questions. Let me go ahead and jump on them here. So one is remind us again, what is the light range that destroys viruses and bacteria? Well, so that's a little bit of a, a, a question. Um, you know, the ultraviolet light um, is below 400 and the uh, visible light is 405 nanometers. So uh, they all kill bacteria. There are studies now that show that the 405 nanometer light can kill viruses if it's um, suspended in um, uh, like saliva or bodily fluids. Um, viruses, uh, UV light can kill all of that. That's for sure. Uh, it's just not safe for people and it can damage, um, uh, you know, the um, surfaces in the room. And question about, uh, can you use this in dental offices? Any studies? Um, so the answer is yes, you can use it in dental offices. Uh, no studies in dental offices for visible light at this time. Uh, part of the challenge is uh, just making sure that the dental office knows to put any of its um, uh, light sensitive epoxy away because uh, many of the epoxies absorb blue light. If you look in a dental office, the lights over the patient typically are amber in color because they have a blue cutting feature, meaning they take out the blue component. So if you were to put this into a dental office, uh, you just need to make sure that there's no um, uh, uh, damage to these epoxies or resins. And let's see, uh, do you recommend these type of lighting in IP rooms? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by an IP room. If you could respond and clarify, I would appreciate that. I'll move on to the next one while you do that. Um, how do we specify cost and range? So you want to specify a visible light disinfection and for this area. And that's when the manufacturer should come back with a recommendation on a product. I think if you just specify the use of visible light disinfection, um, that gets the ball rolling. Uh, because if you try to specify dual mode versus single mode, um, that does imply a certain amount of cost. And you can look at critical areas um, like the operating room. Uh, the manufacturer should come back to you and say, if you're going to put this in the operating room, this is how you should do that. Ah, inpatient rooms. Very good. Thank you. IP equals inpatient rooms. So the question was, how do you put this in a room? Well, so this is the challenge. When the, the technology started with the university, they put it into a patient room, uh, occupied patient room. The problem is, of course, that patients want to rest. And when patients want to rest, they turn off the lights. When you turn off the lights, what happens? You get no disinfection. So that's part of the challenge. That's why the patient room proper is a bit hard to use this technology with a reliable outcome. If it's uh, an area like a burn ward or area where the uh, patient uh, or, or where the patient is sedated, then that would make some sense. Uh, you could put the technology in and run it and things should look uh, quite normal, um, work quite normal. But then uh, when you think about the, uh, the, the, the patient bathroom, that's the area where you can kind of do what you want. Uh, again, the patients aren't in there for long periods of time. Uh, they obviously you know, are there for just that short period of time. So it means you can have it in the all blue mode. And another question is, does bacterial growth continue whenever lights are, off, are turned off? For sure, uh, bacteria being reintroduced to the room, just so you know, when, when somebody comes into the room, we're shedding bacteria into the room. And so that bacteria is shed to the environment and it's deposited. So that appears as, I'm gonna say growth, because it's growth within the room. Uh, if you were to look at the amount of bacteria in the room, 
that level will change just because people have brought it into the room. Now, uh, as far as, um, you know, if you run the lights and suppress the bacteria and, and, and kill some off and then you turn it, uh, you know, turn it off, some of that bacteria will certainly regrow. That's why you want to leave the lights on 24 seven. And that's true of anything. If you run UV light on a surface and kill bacteria and then turn it off, the bacteria can regrow. And again, I want to emphasize that this technology I've spoken about today is visible light. Some people will call it UV-A, uh, incorrectly, I might add. And the reason they do that is because the typical blue light that is used for visible illumination is what they mean by blue. This is a separate um, uh, wavelength uh, further down the spectrum. And the, because of that, they just simply call it UV. Uh, even though it's not UV. There is a you know, definition of you know, below 400 is UV, above 400 is non-UV. And uh, the fact that you're above or below changes your safety consideration. So when you, you, when you speak of this technology, you want to make sure you call it visible light. And that differentiates it from UV, A, B, and C. And another question came in about the controls. Uh, the controls are pretty simple for this. It's, that's the benefit of this being a regular lighting uh, product. Um, it's just, uh, you know, regular room sensors, passive infrared, ultrasonic, whatever you like. And you just uh, toggle the uh, mode from uh, the mixed mode, the white plus blue mode, to the all blue mode. All right. It looks like that's about it for now. I'm going to um, go back to sharing. You take control again? Okay. Yes, I'm going to take back control. <laughs> you do that. Um, all right. So just to let everyone know that we have um, several more webinars coming up. Um, so tonight we've got an ARE virtual study guide. And then this Friday, um, same time around noon, we'll be uh, talking with Letterman's about electronic bidding and public bid openings in the COVID era. Um, or sorry, that was Thursday. And then Friday, we've got our member meeting with President Terry Dreyer and um, multiple other um, CEU opportunities coming up. So we just want to say thank you um, to all of you for showing up and um, especially uh, to you, um, Dr. Yonke, for, for sharing this presentation with us. Um, I saw that you had your um, contact information available there at the end. Yep. Um, so hopefully folks can can reach out to you if they have uh, if they have questions. Of course, and we'll make this the slides are certainly, you know, I know you guys make them available through AIA. Um, we have a lot of uh, other information we can make available to you as needed. So however you like to do it. Great. Sounds good. And we'll also um, make this recording available um, through our YouTube channel. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today and hope y'all are staying safe and healthy and, and sane out there and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye everyone.